Jesus, Father, we thank you for the minds and hearts that fill this room today. As we come together for this event, may we be open and be united in your purpose. May we bring to mind only the things that are most important in life, so that as we journey onwards, we would be a blessing to those whose lives we touch. Come, be with us. Inspire us and lead us in your time together. Fill our conversations with our grace and righteous will. Take what we have prepared and multiply our efforts. And when our efforts fail us or fall short, forgive us and remind us of your faithful provision. This we ask through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. She was magna cum laude of Assumption College in Commerce. She has an MBA in Northwestern University in Chicago, the first Filipino and only one of two Asians to take this course. She has never genderized herself, never referred, thought of herself as being a woman in a man's world. I'm very pleased, I'm very pleased to introduce to give our welcome remarks, fellow Towns Awardee, Miss Evelyn Singson. A glad good afternoon and welcome to our honored guests and members of Sheerfield. Uh, who are attending the 2019 Summit of the Shareholders Association of the Philippines. Uh, every year, we at Sharefield labor to create a summit that will not only excite you, but will also open your minds to new ideas, new opportunities, and new challenges. Looking at the offerings during this time of conferences, summits, and conventions, we know that most of what are offered deal with subject matters like disruptive technologies, dis digital transformations, sustainability, environment. Yes, these are very important and very re relevant and timely topics, but maybe there have been too much of them out there that we decided to offer something novel, as we always do in our annual summits. The past five years, we brought you the now and the next generation management teams of A-list companies that can, be, that can be very proud of their highly successful IPOs and their sustainability as stock market favorites for their reputation of good governance. The companies they manage have survived successfully through good and bad times because they have kept their corporate values intact and have cared well for their various stock stakeholders, including their small shareholders, who Sharefield wish to represent. So today's summit is not an exception. We are presenting three power couples who together or separately have transformed lives communities, companies, cities, and their little piece of the country. Being committed to each other as a couple, their personal and their professional lives may not be that simple. We have Marides and BF, and Nanette and Chris, Mikey and Sheila. We all feel we know them, even as many of us have not met them till today, not because they are all celebrities, but because in some way through their work, they have touched our lives. Sometimes they work as a couple, other times they have to pursue their individual callings. Their paths sometimes cross, their goals may sometimes clash. They serve different stakeholders and counter conflicting priorities. Yet, in spite of these complexities, they have remained a couple. 
They will share their stories today on how they decide on their priorities, how they balance career and family, how they resolve conflicts, how together they have accomplished successful outcomes as a power couple. They are living proof of what our parents often reminded us before we took our vows, that the hardest and most important decision we have to make in our life is to choose the right spouse. But, <laughs> but in this choice depends our life's happiness and success. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, let us hear from the wise, the beautiful, and the powerful. Thank you and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, Miss Evelyn. Now I know why I am the MC because uh, I should be the fourth pair here. When my husband was still uh, alive, I widowed in 2001. We had an arrangement as a regional trial court judge, he would marry the couples. And then they would come to me and I would annul the marriages. <laughs> Very uh, convenient, actually. And uh, Evelyn says that this is a story about power couples. Reading their resumes, I think they're more like joint ventures instead of marriages. But to tell you about what this summit really is all about, May I, may I call on Mr. Ramoncito Fernandez, Sheriff Treasurer and Chairperson of this summit committee. Mr. Fernandez was also President and CEO of Manila Water Service Inc. Mainilad. <laughs> Galit ako sa Mainilad kasi tabo-tabo pa rin ang ligo ko. Uh, he was former President and CEO of Metro Pacific Towways before he became before he is, before being president and CEO of My Milan Water Services Inc. Ladies and gentlemen, and LGBTIQ, and the rest of the alphabet soup, please welcome Mr. Ramon. Ako po ay Fernandez ng My Milan My Tubi. Gusto ko lang kung klaruhin. Anyway, um, Sheffield Chair, Mrs. Evelyn Singson, President Francis Lim, distinguished speakers, Sheffield members, students, friends from media, guests, magandang hapon po. Good afternoon. We at Sheffield continue to be passionate with our intent to protect the investor through education and shareholder activism. Various significant events around the globe has happened affecting shareholders. Earlier this year, the revised Corporation Code of the Philippines was passed into law. Only last month, one of the U.S. biggest business groups has dropped the shareholder primacy creed that has driven capitalism for decades, used urging companies to weigh the environment and workers' well-being alongside pursuing profits. China, on the other hand, announced its approval of a new foreign investment law designed to level domestic playing for overseas investors. Today's event would be our sixth annual summit. Since we began holding annual summits in 2014, we have managed to feature an illustrious lineup of speakers, among them PLDT and MPIC Group Chairman Manuel V. Pangilinan, former Finance Secretary Cesar Purisima, Ms. Teresita C. Cawson, the father and son team of Messrs. Oscar and Federico Lopez of the First Philippine Holdings Corporation, and brothers Jaime Augusto 
and Fernando Sobel de Ayala of Ayala Corporation. Last year, we chose the theme, the journey from private enterprise to a public company. The lessons, challenges, and opportunities. With a very interesting lineup of speakers, SMIC Chair, Mr. Josh Shaw, Wilcon Lipo, President and CEO, Ms. Lorraine Bello Cinco Chan, and DNL President and CEO, Mr. Alvin Lau. This year's summit is extra special. We have invited three power couples to share with us how they manage their different stakeholders. It took us some time to get this going as we had to get a common schedule of the three power couples. We promise a very exciting, stimulating, and engaging session with them. Ultimately, by holding this annual summit, Sherfield is able to spread its advocacy and raise the necessary funds to sustain our education, research, and shareholder relations and representation programs. I would therefore like to thank you all for your participation. I also wish to extend Sherfield's deepest gratitude to our event sponsors, our platinum sponsors, San Miguel Corporation, Banco de Oro, First Gen, Metro Pacific, Manila, and MPTC, Philippine Valve, SMIC, SM Prime, and the LT Group. Our gold sponsors, Meralco and Sirtec. Our silver sponsors, Mega World, Divina Law, Filipina Shell, RCBC, Del Monte, DMCI Holdings, and Price Gas Incorporated. Our bronze sponsors, Double Dragon, Mary Mart, Marubeni Philippines, Union Bank, SGV and Company, Victoria's Milling Corporation, Insul Insular Life, and Ayala Land Incorporated, and BPI. Thank you also to our various donors and contributors. I'd like also to make special mention to our official media partners, Philippine Star, Philippine Daily Inquirer, Business World, ANC, and Business News Asia. I also would like to publicly express my gratitude to our hardworking summit secretariat, namely Ada. Where is Ada? Let's give her a big hand. Ada, Mabayad, Ana Pasetes, Abby Beneventura, Oji Kapulong, and to our Sherfield board. Lalong lana po yung presidente natin na pakasipag mag-visit ng sponsors. So, to all our participants, maraming maraming salamat po for sharing, uh, supporting, sharing of promoting faith, F-A-I-T-H, to the investor. Maganing, maraming salamat po at good day. Opinions expressed herein are not necessarily those of our sponsors, especially my opinions. <laughs> Without further ado, we shall now proceed to our first topic, which is inclusive governance. Inclusive governance deals with leadership that encourages openness, participation, and transparency. I'm very pleased to introduce this first power couple because I know them personally. There are many chismes about them. Bayani, Fer Bayani Fernando is what his name suggests. He is a and that is what Bayani means. To our foreigners here, Bayani means hero. But his wife calls him Bayan. No? And Bayan means nation. No. Who is Bayani Fernando? Bayani Fernando, you all know he's a Filipino politician, businessman, and do you know that he is a, was a professional mechanical engineer? Correct? He first ran for public office in 1992 
becoming mayor of Marikina City. His administration as mayor transformed the former municipality into one of the best managed cities and a paradigm of responsive and effective governance. His term saw the transformation of Marikina from a fourth class municipality to a model Philippine city which was accorded with 58 citations and distinctions. In 2002, he was appointed chairperson of the MMDA by then President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. He is notab noted, notable for introducing U-turn slots, greatly increasing the amount of pedestrian overpasses at road intersections, or what are called footbridges. He is also known for pioneering broadcasting of MMDA and sidewalk clearing operations, which, although greatly objected to, now has justified itself because the MMDA has no original plan except to follow yours, Congressman. Opinion. 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 Okay. He briefly served as Secretary of the Department of Public Works and Communications from January 15, 2003 to April 15, 2003. Run for Vice President with Richard Gordon. He is the best Vice President we never had. Representative of the 1st District of Marikina since June 2016 up to the present, present. He is married to a dear friend, Maria Lourdes Fernando, former mayor of Marikina, and the father is here. Father, hello, father. Yeah. Please give a big hand, Sir Ito. It's in the genes, it's in the genes. The daughter, Tala, is also here. Tala is here. Incidentally, as a trivia, Tala is married to John Paul Ang, the oldest son of Ramon Ang. Who doesn't know Ramon Ang? Established BF Corporation as an umbrella company. What we do not know, or what some of you know, is that he is a member of the three tenors, correct? Uh, being a trio with former Environment Secretary Angelo Reyes and former Senator Joey Lima. So good was the group, we are told, that they got invited to perform in US, Canada, Australia, and even asked to perform in a luxury liner. Congressman, don't, don't quit your day job. He's married to Marides Fernando. Should I go on? Will they be speaking separately or together? Okay, but let me introduce Marides. Marides has been a mayor of Marikina since 2001 to 2010. And as mayor, she was a finalist in the 2008 World Mayor Award and won seventh place. She was educated at Institu Institution Teresiana and is an alumni of the best university in Diliman, the University of the Philippines. In the Liman. In the only. Opinion. She finished her hotel and restaurant management in Cornell University and uh, for a while worked at Manila Hotel and was a kitchen consultant. She complete, competently chaired the BF group of companies while her husband was mayor in 1992 to 2001. Famous for the shoe industry, Marikina became notorious as a rape city and hideouts of drug addicts. That completely changed under the leadership of the power couple. Great transformation occurred. The Save the Marikina River project, the Rescue 161 project won the 1995 Kaban Galing Pook Award or Treasure Box for community innovation and exemplary practice in local government. The mayor couple has been actualizing their motto, quote unquote, one job per family. Marikina is now known as, quote, an industry and government friendly, happy working class community. 
It is said that Marikenios can now sleep soundly. So good was their administration that, quote unquote, there are no flies in Marikina. Because even the public markets are very clean. And Marikina, they say despite being where the fault is, Marikina is disaster friendly. If local government were a test the course, Marikina should be the OJT on on-job training laboratory. Ladies and gentlemen, our first power couple, I hope they're still my friends after their introduction, Mayor and Mayor Fernando. I wonder why we are here, no? You're looking for the name of our company. It's at the bottom, at the back of the board. <laughs> it's such an honor to be invited to speak before such an uh, illustrious cloud, uh, crowd as big and as, uh, as this one. Anyway, thank you very much. Attorney Lord Nakapuna for the most beautiful introduction. Uh, me and my wife, and uh, to Evelyn Simpson, to Mon, uh, I know him, Simon uh, Mon Fernandez, was with me, with us in Congress for our, uh, no, for uh, an investigation. Hindi pala alam ni Mon na hindi niya ako customer, I'm with Manila Water. Anyway, uh, we, and also Attorney Lim and uh, uh, Ren Davila, be kind to me in your, uh, as always. And uh, to all of you, magandang hapon po sa kanilang lahat. <clears throat> I have the biggest number of stakeholders among, among you, because I had 13 million of them NBA. And uh, 5 million at the start, the population of Marikina. No? So I'm here. Uh, anyway, we are tasked to tell you of our experiences in public service and enhancing value for our stakeholders, our constituents, and how our family relationship transcended from personal to professional support system and how this lifetime commitment help sustain each other's individual careers. Till today, we're still happily married. Huh? In 1992, with 25 years of management and engineering experience, I left to my business partner, incidentally and luckily, my wife Marides, the management of our growing enterprise. By then, we have built malls, hotels, industrial facilities, and at that era, the tallest building in the country. It was a hard decision to make, to sacrifice our personal time and income to the thankless job in the name of public service. But she took it with grace, and on her own, she built thereafter a building which stood as the tallest in our country until 2015. And as the story goes, my father, 45 years before, in his time as mayor of our town, Marikina, said, uh, Tungkulin ng pamahalaan na ipabatid sa pinakamaliit na mamamayan ang kaniyang mga tungkulin at karapatan sa kapwa, sa mga batas, at kay Bathala. And corollary to that, kailangan mang ibabaw ang makatarong ang kapakanaan na nakakarami laban sa pagkakalika niya. And that's anarchy. In the elections of 1992, which made me mayor of Marikina, I presented a comprehensive program of government premised on the above, which served as my guide in transforming our town to where it is now. By this time, my fascination in construction has passed, and I have great ideas about public service enough to put my adrenaline to action and put forth 
the following. As mayor, I am to build character, not structure. I'm done building structure. So I, I set out to build character. And if I build any structure, in the, in, 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 and in everything we do, it should build character. Discipline, good taste, excellent. And with vision, will, and action, we hit the ground running. And for a start, politika sa banqueta. I have set the sidewalks as the battlefront where I shall confront everyone to effect that much needed change. And to this I say, a man may be king in his domain, but once he sets foot on the sidewalk, he has to know that he is part of a society and have to follow its norm. Politika sa banqueta eventually became disciplina sa banqueta. That gave Marikina the opportunity to change what seemed impossible at the time to achieve. Marikina is already clean and in the pink of health 24 years ago. With every child knowing, mumuntin basura ibulsa muna. We greeted the millennium, year 2000, maybe the first in the third world, as the first city in the third world with all homes with toilets. And we're the first and only city to this day with a food laboratory right in the marketplace, in the public market. We are squatter free since 20 years ago, in city relocation for all the 30,000 squatter families in our commune, in our town. We have instituted a five minutes emergency response time, ambulance, fire and police, better than the 911 of America. We have walkable sidewalk. We have broad discipline. And we have, we have considered the city is the school for everybody. The best city hall that we have. No people need to go. That is the, uh, the, the that's what we now call uh, uh, ease of doing business. You don't have to, to go to city hall to have it. Dress code in city hall. No slippers and no shoes. Kahit magbabayad ka ng million million, magsapatos ka muna, bumili ka sa palengke ng sapatos at pantalon, but you will not be allowed entry into the city hall. You have to respect the city hall as much as every employee in that hall is respecting you. And the city hall is the second most important edifice or facility in any community, next only to the church. We have drug quarantine. We have no animals on the streets and no animals in homes where in homes in high population density area. Yung maraming masyadong tao, you cannot even have a dog or a cat of any animal in your house because 80% of diseases are transferred by way of these animals. We have a usable river park, seven kilometers long. We have 14 kilometers of jogging, jogging lane along, along the river. We have... Uh, the first ever bicycle lanes covering the whole town and many others that are worthy of note. On and on until my last day as mayor and succeeded by my wife, she continued my unfinished works and established notable projects on her own as I attend to a much bigger role. Year 2002, I was called by then President GMA to the MMDA with only one marching order. Do, do what you did in Marikina. What you did in Marikina, do it here in Metro Manila. And so I did just that and at will. And as media has defined, defined it, is the media who defined it as political will. I promoted to the last day of my stint as chairman of the Metro Manila Development Authority. The MMD, as many of you old, old folks may remember, 
the Verdugo in, the, in his passion for clearing demolition of structures, vendors, garbage on the sidewalks and roadways. I remember 2002 when we first cleared the Visoria, as you can see it now, yeah, orderly and good to see. Now, uh, then we have the foot bridges, we have the U turns, we have the wet flag, we have the mob mobile office, we have the mobile jail. Organized bus route, no contact apprehension, nose in, nose out, yellow lane. Metro Guapo, pink line, pink everywhere. Bawal mak nakahubad, bawal tumawid, ito nakamamatay. Cleaning waterways, flood control, street dwellers care unit, Commonwealth Avenue, elevated U-turn, Guapo Tel, Cadena de Amor, road railings and fences. If ever did any good, at least it added to our vocabulary. <laughs> the very thought, uh, of the Verdugo in the mind of many helped to quell any revolution and made it easy for our operatives to do what seemed to be undoable those days. I am proud to say that I cleared 60 to 70 percent of our Metro Manila roadways, which served as a model to follow for the local government units in the country, then and now. Proud that we did all this in 18 years without killing let alone putting to jail any person. I built the, most, the best jail in the Philippines on the, on the top floor of our, of our justice hall. You can see the best jail, but I never sent anybody to jail. Wala akong ginawa ni like a good father. Sinaway ko lang lahat ng tao. Ang mga taga-Marikina, in Metro Manila, I did the same thing. And uh, I think it worked. At, to, to a certain degree. <laughs> and I attribute this blessing to the dedication of all those who worked with me, each man to his calling, with my respects for them all. They should be proud that we made Marikina the most livable city, and to this day, the most manageable city in the country. With my dear wife, while my dear wife was busy as mayor of Marquina and I as MMDE chair, luckily fresh from school, our daughter came on board to manage our business interest. Since my unsuccessful bid for the vice presidency in 2010, ambitious, no? Huh? And the mayor's uh, three-term limit ends with both, and uh, the, my wife, the mayor, three-term limit ends we both had a respite from we had a respite from public service elections of 2016 and after 16 years of absence in the political scene in marikina i ran and won to represent the first congressional district of the town and now i own my second term and as deputy minority leader in the house and far from become, becoming speaker of congress of the philippines and consigned, now consigned as deputy to my wife for life. <laughs> and uh, so I set out to build character, as I said earlier. And I'm happy and proud to say to all that Marikina has become bayan ng ugali, bayan ng mabubuting tao. And all over town, I'm now carving this in stone for everyone to remember forever. And this will be a reminder to every Marikanian they have to protect that one good thing for all of us. Uh, in uh, construction parlance, I would say the bulldozer, and I am the grader. <laughs> and I uh, picked up from where he left off, which is often where he is uh, very uh, good at. He's good at starting. He's good at... Uh, just trailblazing, and somebody has to, you know, make sure that it's leveled off. So under BF's watch, Marikina became a highly urbanized city from a fourth-class municipality. 
So uh, Marikina uh, was teeming with opportunities and possibilities after nine years of complete. And uh, I was chosen by the local party to continue with the work of Bayani. And I under the slogan, BF built the house and MCF will make it a home. So Marikina's transformation stemmed from this positive mindset. The change could happen because in the last nine years, people were motivated to believe that the change is possible as long as they put their hearts and minds to it. And during my tenure as city mayor, I pushed for a new paradigm in local governance where we had strong will and a can-do attitude, which are the key elements in our transformation. Marikina's trans uh, experience underscores the importance of giving leadership the leeway to get things done. So two qualities easily describe Marikina today, discipline and order. And I used to say, we need order before we have peace. And order is very basic in children. By kindergarten, you have this toy where you have these shapes. The star shape goes into the star hole. The round shape goes into the round hole. But when we get older, we forget that the sidewalks are for people to walk. The roads are for the cars to pass. The basketball court is for people to play. We kind of mix that around. And we use the sidewalks as funeral parlors, sala sets, parking garages, and everything. So we have to educate people and uh, instill in them that it's a purpose for everything. And in order for order to take place, you must put things in the right place. But first, you have to have the place to put things. So you have to build the sidewalks. So we built the sidewalks during my term. We completed 99% of all sidewalks in Marikina was completed during my term. So people respect and follow the law in Marikina. There are no garbage piles on the sidewalks anymore. We needed to reiterate, reiterate, reiterate all these programs that Bayani had started. Sidewalks are pedestrian friendly in Marikina. The river is squatter free. The public market is clean and orderly and the healthiest in the Philippines. And people consciously use pedestrian lanes when crossing the streets. There are no trash cans in Marikina because we have the principle, basura mo, alagaan mo. And these are some of the manifestations of discipline or order that reign now in Marikina. So the transformation started with a principle called the broken window pane principle, which was used by Mayor Giuliani in New York. And it says that people adapt themselves to their environment. So if it's an environment is in disarray, like a broken window plane, nobody fixes it, then people tend to behave roughly. And when there is physical order, people behave with civility and people feel at ease everywhere in the city. Enforcement has also been instrumental in Marikina's transformation with the discipline as a banqueta, sidewalks have been liberated from all forms of obstruction. And some say that the sidewalk is the most important indicator of urbanization. So when you start seeing uh, washing machines in the sidewalk, that's a big indicator that people are not educated enough and you need to educate them. Marikina's pedestrian-friendly sidewalks are complemented by a network of bicycle lanes that connect schools, factories, and government institutions. The bicycle lanes were started during Bayani's term, and again, I continued with them during my term, so that in the river now, we have 22 kilometers of bicycle lanes where people can converge and use going to work. We also have uh, consistency and constancy in the enforcement of laws in the city. The full implementation of the National Building Code is a good start, but it takes political will to really enforce it. It's probably only in Marikina where you have a seven-day building permit approval process because you have a checklist, you complete the checklist, you give it to a window, not to the city engineer's office, another window, 
and when you complete all the requirements, you just come back for it in seven days. But if the checklist is not complete, they return it to you right then. So it's a seven-day process. And so uh, strict enforcement of the building code provides better order also in the city. We run our city hall like a private corporation. When people come for favors, it's either saying yes if it's good or no if the transaction is bad. Everybody has to toe the line and there is no preferential treatment offered to anybody because we believe that that will destroy our principles and policies. The city hall also gives uh, bonuses to uh, performing departments. We give bicycles every month for the best employees and the bottom 5% of our employees are let go every month if they're not performing. So they know this. And there's a continuous line of people who are applying for work. So we tell them, well, if you cannot get the job done, then we'll have to find somebody else. The business registration process has also been streamlined from 14 to 17 steps. It was during our term when we came up with the Citizens Charter, which is the city guidebook, which is actually a directory of all government services with a list of department heads, uh, forms that you can download on the internet, how many days permits should be released, and the tasking of every department in the city. So it gives all the public a guide to how to use your city and how to make things happen. So this is important in promoting transparency and predictability. Integral to our pursuit of continuing improvement and go governance is benchmarking. And we benchmarked with Singapore. We said we wanted to be a little Singapore and we model ourselves after the good and award-winning programs of different localities. So I must stress that for good governance to come about, institutions must be able to execute competence and credibility. They must win people's respect, trust, and cooperation. And people don't mind paying their taxes if they see that every cent they pay for in government is returned to them in the form of good programs and services. When you talk about stakeholders in the city, I think one of the measures of uh, stakeholdership is if your real estate value have increased on account of good governance, then you can really say that from a value of 60 pesos in Marikina, at the end of our term, that 60 pesos was probably 20,000 pesos. So that's a good, good measure. A good indicator of credibility also is the ability to finish projects which have been started by the city. This has become our policy. All projects must be finished on schedule. And people only get to appreciate the beauty or impact of the undertaking when it is completed. So we try to be a government of performance. Our operational performance is simple, yet partial to measurable results. Our performance targets don't originate from the air. We take time. Uh, to plan every year for what's going to happen, what we will deliver to the stakeholders, and our ability to consistently raise our city's revenue annually is an important indicator of institutional competence. During my watch, we introduced a number of viable economic enterprises. We said we cannot be dependent on taxes and increasing taxes every year. The city needs to be creative as well. So we had economic enterprises like the Maritina Sports Park. We put up the Shoe Museum, which generates revenue. We have a convention center, which generates revenue as well. We have an annual river, Trang Changge, which generates 30 million every year for the city. And we're able to use these for cultural projects. 40 meters of water flooded the city during my last term in office. But Maritina has withstood the test of time. Bayani, being chairman of MMDA at the time, helped us with the rescue efforts, and we declared that in 30 days, Marikina will clean itself up. With a, with a, with a can-do attitude of the people and uh, the positive mindset, we were able to do that. In 30 days, 
the MMDA team with the army and the military marched out of Marikina that had cleaned himself up. So Marikina is now better prepared to deal with calamities. Well, leaders come and go, but the culture of discipline, the can-do attitude, and the passion for excellence remain not only amongst its people, but also the leaders, the department heads, and the workers in government. The pressure to sustain good governance now emanates from the people. So when people say, why didn't you go back as mayor? Why didn't you? Because I don't believe that you should be there forever. And I believe that people who have learned should be given the opportunity to show their creative ideas and see how we can continue and sustain the gains that we have learned. But the Kenyans will not allow to regress back to the old times. They are now very critical. They have telephone numbers of all the department heads, and they call, and they're mad if their garbage is not picked up on the day and time that it is supposed to be picked up. So you can see that, wow, oh, you know, when we have raised the benchmark of service, people are now looking at service. And people complain, and that is what I like, that people are now part of our governance. So this is Marikina today, teeming with life and possibilities, and a success story that validates the precept that anything is possible with a strong will and a can-do attitude. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Up next, we have Mr. Christopher Crispo and Ms. Nanette Medved Po, also good friends of mine. Chris, well, let me tell you, I've been asked to shorten my introduction, so I will make it short, but I can't resist this cheesiness. The Poe brothers, the Poe brothers, are a brilliant bunch having graduated as summa cum laude and magna cum laude in universities abroad. Chris is the third of four brothers. All are good looking. Sons of Taipan, Ricardo Poe Sr., who is among the top 50 riches in the Philippines according to Forbes magazine. The Poe family owns Century Group, which is the largest canned tuna company in the Philippines and is in the food and beverage business. Chris is now executive chair and is focusing on expanding outside the canned business, but still on food. He is also the chairperson of Shakey's Pizza Ventures Inc. He has an MBA from Harvard Business School and an undergraduate from Wharton School. Relevant to our topic this afternoon of synergizing profit and social good, let me say that Chris is a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Wildlife Fund Philippines, incidentally. That's where we sit together as members of the Board of Advisors. He is chairperson of CF Foundation, which is a nonprofit that supports the educational needs of underprivileged youth in the Philippines. And he is also in the advisory board of Bantay Bata Children's Village, a shelter for abused children. He is married to another good friend, Nanette. Nanette Medved Po, not really, right? is an award-winning film actress, TV host, model, philanthropist, and business person. She is the founder of Generation Hope Inc. and Friends of Hope Inc., which produces both company-branded and co-branded consumer goods. Profits from the Hope line of products are devoted to improving health plan, improving the public school education system as well as small holder, holder farmer productivity through its agricultural interventions. Nanette is also the founder of HopeX, which is a nonprofit entity that offers business and consumers an easy and responsible way to be accountable for plastic. Hashtag no to plastic is her mantra. Born on January 21, 1971 in Honolulu, Hawaii, an alma mater of Babson College, where she graduated summa cum laude in finance and entrepreneurship. A bit of chismis, we all know her for being Darna, the original Darna. 
25 films later, Nanette ended her film career uh, where she co-starred co with Fernando Poe Jr. in the film Ang Dalubhasan in 2000. She has two sons with uh, Chris, correct? One is 15 and one is 11. And uh, in 2002, she announced that she is quitting showbiz to help in the various advocacies of her family. First to speak is Chris or Nanette? It's Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, another power couple, Chris and Nanette Poe. Good afternoon. So someone asked me earlier who's going to speak first. I said me because I'll be the appetizer and my wife will be the main course. Uh, anyway, she's easier on the eyes and a much better public speaker than me, I assure you. Um, so members of the Board of Trustees, uh, nice to see some familiar faces. Um, investors and guests, thank you for having us. Um, so I usually don't accept these uh, public speaking invitations, no, Karen knows that. Um, but uh, see, Ed Francisco was the one who asked me, no? and uh, since we always go to him if we need to raise money and borrow money, uh, obviously I, <laughs> I had to accept, no? so Ed, um, boss, anyway, um, so what we'll do with the minutes that were given to us, um, I thought we'd just talk about our day jobs and a little bit about our family and then we'll leave the rest uh, of the more fun stuff to Karen. So Karen, you know, you're known for your incisive and probing questions. Please be kind. Anyway, so um, yeah, just a little bit of introduction. I said I would talk about my day job, no? So I do chair uh, Century Pacific Food Inc., uh, a publicly listed company. Um, also chair of Shakey's, um, which uh, where we have the uh, rights to the Philippine uh, territory as well as most of Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the Middle East. Uh, Century Pacific Group. Century Pacific Group is the family, the family holding company, and Arthur Land is our investment in uh, real estate, also a public listed company. Um, I also um, listed my advocacies. I do consider this to be part of my day job. Um, I am the president of my father's uh, foundation. The main advocacy is uh, hunger alleviation and nutrition. Um, I'm a, as Lorna said, that's where we met Lorna. I'm a mem I'm current member board of trustee of uh, WWF Philippines. Uh, recently joined the board of uh, Asia Society. And I'm a board member of my wife's company, Friends of Hope. Um, many people mistake Friends of Hope to be the CSR arm of Century that is furthest, furthest from the truth. Um, uh, Friends of Hope, which my wife will be talking about early, uh, later. The vision is all my wife and I'm just a cheerleader and uh, supporting cast. No? Now just very quickly about Century Pacific Food. So I mess it up usually and then she fixes it. Very obvious. Um, I think we're fixed. The one, the one before that. There you go. No, century. That's it. That's it. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Century Pacific Food Inc. Um, most people know us as a tuna company. Uh, we are. Uh, I'd like to think of us as a branded food company. Um, more, more than a quarter of our business is actually also meat. Uh, we are also a leading OEM manufacturer for tuna and coconut products. And we are also fast becoming a dairy company. No? So uh, market leader in a few categories in, um, canned, in canned tuna, uh, in uh, um, canned meats. Um, we have a fast growing milk business and I already spoke about our OEM businesses. I think Shakey's on the other hand. Um, so we are not a QSR uh, company, so I, I, I hope most of you know Shakey's. You go there, you sit down, you're served. So we're called a full-service restaurant. So Shakey's is the number one uh, full-service restaurant chain in the Philippines. And as a restaurant brand overall, including the QSRs, uh, we are the third, you know, third largest 
QSR, uh, sorry, restaurant brand in the Philippines. By the end of the year, we would have about 250 stores. Um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we also have um, uh, shakies in other parts of the world, uh, currently in the Middle East, soon in the rest of Southeast Asia. As for Arthaland, um, uh, we are, uh, Arthaland just had its beginnings uh, about 10 years ago, so it's fast becoming uh, known as a quality boutique developer. Um, all of our projects are sustainable and green projects, you know? so we have a couple of projects in BGC, we have a, 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 an ongoing one in Cebu, and, and a few others. Uh, Savia is um, it's our project in uh, the new Arca South, which is the old FBI, you know? and a few others in the pipeline. So, uh, as previously mentioned, I am just the appetizer, so I now give you the main course, my wife, Nanette. Thank you. So um, I'm not going to go over um, the talking points on my CV anymore. I think Lorna did a very good job of that earlier and gave a little bit more. Thank you. Um, thank you again to all of our friends here at Sherfield for having us. I'm going to present a very simple deck about hope because unlike my husband's company, which I'm sure you guys know a lot about, uh, there are many of you here who may not know about hope. Um, and to my husband's point, we are not the CSR of Century. We're a, separately, we're a separate company altogether. In fact, we're a separate group of companies. And so I'm going to walk you through a very simple, hopefully, explanation of what Hope does. So Hope Business for Good is um, the first Philippine company to donate 100% of its profits. Uh, in our case at HOPE, we donate 100% to the building of public school classrooms in a partnership with the Department of Education. We're also the first company in the Philippines to be a B Corp. Um, our hope is that at some point there will be more B Corps in the Philippines, but at the moment we're the only B Corp. Um, B Corps that you may know about are companies like Ben & Jerry's, uh, Clean Canteen, Patagonia, and basically these are companies who uh, who meet the highest standards of uh, the highest standards of uh, environmental, social, transparency, accountability, and performance standards. Um, so Hope is the first to do that. We're also the first company to water. So for those of you who don't like plastic, uh, there's a boxed version, and we're also the first company. Uh, in the Philippines and potentially beyond to be plastic neutral. We've been plastic neutral since um, January of 2018, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later since many of you may not understand what that term means. So Hope, very simply, as a brand, has two companies and just recently three companies under it. The first one is our for-profit, which is Generation Hope which basically engages in all of our commercial activities, right? So the water that you see is sold by that company, uh, as well as any other products that you see that are Hope branded. And we then donate 100% of that profit into the non-profit entity, which is Friends of Hope, which spends the money. So it spends the money to build classrooms, or do our agriculture venture, or whatever else it is that we're doing at Hope. So that's how it is structured. Um, Sorry, how hope works. So a lot of people wonder how hope works. Uh, this is kind of our virtuous circle, we'd like to think. Um, we basically sell our products to retail partners, whether it's Starbucks or 7-Eleven or Shangri-La or whatever, or Doosit. And um, our customers support nation building through buying our products. We then use the profits to build public school classrooms. And then through a partnership with the Department of Education, we give a tax credit to our retail partners. So that's kind of the virtuous circle of hope um, in our operation. Uh, to date, our education impact has been that we um, have impacted about almost 17,000 students, and we have 91 classroom builds around the country. These are the locations that we build. Um, you'll notice that. A lot of our builds are in Mindanao, and that's 
purely because DepEd has the greatest need there, and so we try to situate ourselves there. Um, our education initiative at Hope, um, I always like to say, because people, when we go to places like that, that was one of our last turnovers, people always say, oh, thank you so much for giving us classrooms. But the truth is, is I don't give these people classrooms. The people that give the classrooms are people like you. When you buy a bottle of Hope, or even here at Ducit, who's a customer, when you buy a bottle of Hope through Ducit, it's you guys that give the classroom to these people. I'm simply the person who makes sure that all that money gets funneled properly. So um, that's the whole idea of Hope. On the Hope neutral, on the plastic neutral side, I'll explain first um, our footprint. So our footprint is, um, actually I'll start with how, I'll start with what plastic neutral is. Um, plastic neutral is basically, because we, when we started HOPE in 2012, um, the issue of plastic packaging or single-use packaging was not such a big issue. And when we realized that it was, the last thing we wanted to do was um, solve one problem in education by creating another with the environment. And so we made it our company mission to find a way to offset our footprint. If we were going to sell uh, water in plastic, we need to be responsible for that. And so what we wound up doing was um, coming up with several partnerships that allowed us to offset the footprint. And the way we do it, and I'm gonna take you through four processes, is first, when we, whenever Hope sells a bottle of water, we charge ourselves an internal plastic tax. And so just like, in your companies, you would have VAT, which is automatically added to your invoice. In our case, we have an education tax and a plastic tax, which is charged to me internally. It gets accrued into a fund. And at the end of each month, we take that fund to recover, in this case, post-consumer plastic. So let's say, for example, uh, each bottle is 10 grams of plastic, and there is a certain value associated with recovering one gram of plastic. If I sell one ton in one month of plastic, I then have that amount of money to recover it. So let's just say it's 5,000 pesos per ton. I then have to go out into the marketplace and recover one ton of plastic. And what we do in our specific case now, bring it to co-processors uh, like Wholesome or like a boy to says uh, Republic Cement, and they use it to replace coal in the production of cement. No, so what happens is they take our plastic and they recover the fuel in it, right? Because plastic is basically petroleum. So we get rid of our plastic footprint that way. So we don't recycle it, we don't upcycle it, we don't turn it into benches. We literally allow co-processors to recover the fuel properties of the plastic and then it's gone. Um, so this is how we as a company have chosen to offset our plastic. We are not saying this is the absolute best way to do it in the world, but it's currently the best way we have thought in the Philippines given the lack of ways to get rid of plastic or recycle plastic. This is, we figure, um, rather than do nothing, we'd rather do something, no? Until we find better solutions. Now, when we did this and announced it on Karen's show, we got so much feedback about companies who would like to do the same. There are manufacturers who don't want to actually be part of the problem. So they reached out to us and said, wow, can you help us come up with the, our own path to plastic neutral? And as a result, we came up with what is potentially the first plastic credit exchange in the world. Um, in fact, it's supposed to be launched at the end of the year, but we already started operations. Um, and this works very similar to a carbon credit exchange but it's a plastic credit exchange. And so what we have done is we have slowly started to add capacity of processors who pass the environmental emission standards. I mean, both Chris and I serve on WWF, so we have a sensitivity for this, no? So we are very careful about the capacity that we add to the exchange, and we also have buyers who want to offset their plastic credit. So let's just see, for example, I'll use Hope so that I don't have to get anybody in trouble. 
So in the case of hope, when I say I'm going to get rid of one ton of plastic post-consumer because that's what I sold into the marketplace, that doesn't mean I'm going to go out and recover one ton of hope plastic bottles because logistically that would be too expensive, diba? But what I will guarantee is I'll say, okay, that one ton might, cons might constitute Coke bottles or palm olive sachets or cooking oil bottles or anything for as long as it's equivalent tonnage weight in plastic I'm getting rid as much as I'm putting in no so that is where our new track so uh, hopefully you'll hear, hear more about this towards the end of the year when we do a formal launch but this is already operating and we have people who have come on board and are very eager to take that capacity actually our bottleneck now is um, being able to get the plastic post consumer right because that's where that's where the challenge is, is in the collection of plastic. Okay, so that's the exchange. And then the last part of hope, which people don't really know about because it's not forward facing, is that we actually have a, a, an agriculture uh, intervention business in Mindanao. Um, the reason why this isn't heard about a lot in hope is because this is fully funded by U.S. companies like Costco and Vita Coco. So they have um, funded these. Uh, interventions that allow us to help smallholder farmers in Mindanao uh, increase their capacity. So I won't bore you so much with this, but this is something we are also, is very close to our hearts. No? Our interventions are replanting, intercropping, uh, farmer training, and of course increasing market access. And these are the locations in Mindanao that we operate. And Chris will talk you through the family stuff. Okay, okay so we'll both talk through this. Um, yeah, so uh, so that was her day job, and I spoke about my day job. But actually, there's um, we operate in a larger context, you know, which is our business family, the Poe family. And um, um, actually, uh, my wife Nanette is was chosen as the chairperson of the Poe Family Council, right? So, what is the Poe Family Council? The Poe Family Council is a group of people um, composed of myself and my siblings, our spouses, and all the next generation Poe family members uh, who are of age. You know? And um, uh, so I, it's a, for me, it's a big deal that number one, uh, it's an in-law, right, who is the head of, a family, of the family council of a Chinese family. Uh, number two, it's a woman. Uh, number three, it's my wife. Um, but what is what is the what is the family council supposed to do, right? So the main thing is, um, according to research, only three percent of family businesses make it past the third generation, right? So three percent out of one hundred companies, ninety-seven will fail and not make it beyond the third generation. So that is something we are preparing for, and that's why we formalized this governance structure. Uh, and what is the charter of a family council? Uh, number one, the main reason for failure is there is no open communication, and families are very poor at communicating with each other. Uh, yeah, you might go on trips together, but you never really talk about real issues. No? So that is the number one mission of the family council, which is to foster open communications. We do have a family constitution, so it is the family council's responsibility to uh, make sure that there's buy-in among the group. Um, a big part also of what the family council does is to make sure that um, family members are united about the purpose of what the, the business or the family business is supposed to do. Uh, business update. And then we have um, different subcommittees. No? So we're, we're, we're running it like a, we're running the family like an like a actual business organization. No? So we do have subcommittees. Uh, there's the Education and Development Committee, which uh, the, the main charter of that is to make sure that we are training the future leaders uh, of family members. No? Uh, of course, there's the social committee to make sure that there's uh, good communication and bonding. And then there's 1G is basically my parents. No? So the family council 
comes together to make sure that uh, one G, Mr. and Mrs. Ricardo Po Sr., all their needs, medical, home needs, etc., are taken care of. No? Um, the Family Council is also very active in deciding what the uh, philanthropy uh, outreach and activities are. Uh, we had a, an episode uh, earlier over the summer uh, about members of the family not agreeing, and it's the, the charter of the Family Council to make sure uh, that conflicts are mediated. Yeah. Uh, I already talked about uh, taking care of uh, 1G. So just a little bit about the development committee. Um, so what we do is, uh, I am actually the chair of this committee. My wife serves as one of the leaders. That means I do a lot of the talking and utos, and she does most, most of the work. And that's not a joke, it's real. Um, so what is, the fam what is the development committee supposed to do? As I mentioned, it's meant to develop the future uh, leaders in the family. Uh, we have four tracks of uh, members of the third generation. Uh, preteen, no? so generally what happens is they're exposed to the family history. We talk about values, uh, found what the va what the founders had to go through uh, to give them what they need, uh, what they have today. Um, educational, these would be like high school and uh, teen uh, type family members. So we make sure they understand uh, and start get getting to understand what's going on in the business and. Um, uh, get them through internship, internships during the summer, and um, try to understand what their passions are and hopefully marry that with uh, our family's different business activities. Then there are the young professionals who are post-university, post-college, so we help them um, uh, with their careers. We actually have a HR manager on staff uh, as part of the development committee just taking care of the next generation. No? And then finally, the fourth track is uh, to make sure that uh, if family members want to be uh, involved in management, that they have the right training, the right qualifications. Not all family members need to be managers. Um, they can, they, most of them will end up being owners, but the ones who choose not to be a, a, um, a manager can be an owner, but then the ones who want to be very involved in the business, running day to day, the qualifications are also different. So that's where Nanette and I actually really do a lot of work together. And then fin finally, with you know, all of these different activities, this is our most important venture. You know, see, this is uh, the Chris and Nanette Po uh, nuclear family. So those are our kids, uh, Gandon who's 15 and Joss 11. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Chris and Nanette. I actually am involved with hashtag no to plastic. I've gotten rid of all the plastic people in my life. <laughs> or I have filed the appropriate cases against the plastic people in other people's lives. <laughs> but this family council, I think, uh, might distract, detract from our lawyer's fees because there are no more family problems. You don't need lawyers anymore. But I still support it. Okay, so thank you to Chris and Annette. Now let's hear from our third couple who are a combination of the first two. Our first couple, uh, Congressman and the uh, Mayor, were a political couple. Our second couple was a private sector couple. Our third is a combination. One is in the corporate world and one is in public service. We have with us Congressman Michael, or Mikey Romero, is a two-term congressman representing one Pacman party list. He is the leader of the party list block and deputy speaker of the 18th Congress of the Philippines. Representative Romero every year gives medical and educational benefits to some 15,000 or more Filipinos. He was awarded Outstanding Congressman in 2016 and 2018 by Super Brands Philippines. Before joining politics, Congressman Romero had been CEO of Harbor City Port Terminal and Pacifica Inc. and was chairman of Global Port 900, Manila North Harbor Port, 
micro tech capital and 168 Pacific Mining Ferrum Pacific Mining Corporation and Vice Chairman of Air Asia Philippines. He is an alumnus of the De La Salle University, the best university in Taft Avenue. <laughs> and played for its basketball varsity team and was awarded by his alma mater with a lifetime achievement for sports. As a keen spokesperson, he captains the country's polo team and owns a basketball team called Manila Sharks and a PBA team, Global Port Batang Pier. Sheila, his beloved wife, hi Sheila, Bermudez Romero, is the chairperson of FNS Holdings Inc., the majority shareholder of Air Asia Inc. Philippines, and she was recently elected as Vice Chair of Air Asia Inc. Philippines. Sheila is also the Chairman and CEO of the Roku, Roku Group of Companies, which holds the master franchise of the restaurant Nara Thai Cuisine. She also owns Roku Sushi and Ramen, as well as Nine Sushi Nori with her daughter Milka. In 2013, Sheila founded the I Want to Share Foundation, whose primary mission is to empower women and to help children by assisting them in health and education-related concerns. The foundation also gives financial assistance to other foundations with the same advocacy and supports the improvement of the Hema Peria Onco Ward of the Philippine General Hospital and provides funding for the medical assistance of over 300 children afflicted with cancer at the PGH. I Want to Share Foundation also supports over 600 children of farmers in Agdangan, Quezon through the Luminous Cross of Grace. As patrons of Philippine art, Sheila and Mikey through I Want to Share Foundation recently helped a fundraising with Salcedo Auctions Gable and Block for the benefit of the Children's Cancer Ward of PGH. They have been married for 28 years and blessed with five children. Ladies, our power couple, Mikey and Sheila Romero. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, yung daughter ko is uh, right there at the back. Our uh, first... Uh, she is 26 years old and giving me a approved sign. <laughs> anyway, uh, most of you are, uh, I was uh, part of Phoenix Ed this year. I was part of MAP, Tita Evelyn and uh, Ed. <laughs> and of course, Simon is also here. You know, so, of uh, Sherfield Association, uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, anyway, uh, I want to talk about uh, how we as a couple uh, live through our daily lives. But of course, I want to share first my journey in life, which there's a short presentation that I uh, put up together. Uh, from sports to business and to politics. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So anyway, um, my education, uh, I started, of course, from the De La Salle University. I took up my management, and uh, I also took up my doctorate degree in both uh, De La Salle and uh, finished uh, my PhD, double PhD in economics and uh, political and management. Next slide, please. So my journey as a businessman, I started, and uh, Ed is also one of my banker, <laughs> like uh, Chris and uh, Lanet. Of course, I would like also to greet my, the Deputy Minority Leader 
of the house, uh, Tito Bayani and Tita Marides. So uh, my journey as a businessman, it all started uh, after I came back from Singapore to be a venture capitalist in 2000. I came back and started from a vast land. Next slide. So I started from the vast piece of land, what they call now the Harbor Center, and it's uh, the bottom slide, in 2006. And from nothing, it became about close to 1,000 ships, international ships, every year. No? So um, in 2009, uh, I won, we won the bid for the North Harbor, and this is the first picture upstairs is uh, how, uh, how I made it uh, into a modern port. It used to be chaotic, the North Harbor, and now it is uh, this one. Uh, So it has now cranes and it's not chaotic and I put up the, we put up the pa first passenger terminal which has about 3 million passengers a year. So I put it up again from scratch, from scratch and finished it in 2013. Okay, from there on I built a uh, what they call the global port, which put together has about 30 million tons of cargoes every year, or about uh, 2 million containers. And I um, consolidated them under global port, which uh, at the time was about, um, it went to about $600 million in uh, market cap. So I was also in uh, mining, uh, power, and together with uh, MVP, we bought the uh, Burger King franchise, franchise at that time. It was, I think, uh, 2012 or something like that. <laughs> so now our main business is uh, into airline. Uh, we started Air Asia in 2010. In 2013, we, we started just with uh, two airplanes, and it was in Clark. Uh, three years after, our partners, the Malaysian counterparts, decided to expand and buy the Zest Airways, which has the franchise uh, of uh, Ambassador Yao. And from there on, we, we became a little bigger, faster, and um, this 2019 uh, revenues went to about 30 billion, and we had uh, we we're going through 27 planes at this point. Uh, this year also, and last year as well as this year, it has become um, quite uh, substantial for me and my wife because we the local partners decided to, to divest their investments. So from 15.6%, we became 45%. And uh, so that's it. And hopefully, we can consolidate the last 15% or to come up to 60% ownership of the company in the next two weeks. <laughs> so anyway, the airline industry is booming, so that's why we are very uh, aggressive with that. No? Uh, I also have the port in Zamboanga. Uh, well, I'm building the Mandawe Global City in Cebu. 
just recently, we went into power business. I am, uh, we are now operating the Zamboanga City Electric Power Distribution. May taga Zamboanga City ho ba dito? <laughs> we will try to fix your electricity, sir. <laughs> no. But uh, we are the investment management for 25 years in Zamboanga City of about 200,000 households. No? So, in line with my power business now, I also bought the 70 megawatt hydropower plant in Bakun from uh, Vivant. So it's now uh, operating and trading under the Wesson. Uh, from 2003 to 2016, because of the jobs we created in the port business, we have uh, brought into context about 10,000 jobs and about 25 billion in infrastructure development in the whole Philippines. Uh, as a sportsman, I headed the National Sports Association of uh, shooting as well as cycling and we have uh, given the country gold, silver, and medals and bronze medals for the Southeast Asian Games. And hopefully, uh, this uh, Southeast Asian Games in the future, this, this 2019, uh, I'll, be, I'll be captaining the Philippine national polo team, dalawang gold medal puto. And hopefully, for the first time in the history of uh, this sport in the Philippines, uh, we get the gold medal. The highlight of my sports life was back in 2012 when uh, I led the Philippine uh, delegation to the 2012 London Olympics. I was the uh, uh, official delegate and uh, napakasarap po maglakad uh, within the circles of the uh, Olympics. Uh, as one of the 21 delegate into that uh, London Olympics. So I have served also as uh, part of the SBP together with Mon. I served also as chairman of the PBA, also together with Mon Fernandez. Uh, I also served as chairman of the PBL, the WPBL, and the other uh, sports uh, uh, related uh, industries. So um, this is my passion now after, of course, giving a lot or the business side of my life, of our life, me and Sheila's life. After we, we the, the business side has been very good to us. In 2016, I decided to give back or be part uh, be part of my life a public public service. So, in 2016 to 2019, it was my first term as uh, congressman, and together with, uh, of course, uh, Congressman Bayani, magka classmate po kami. So in 2016, we were we got 1.4 million votes. We were the third highest in terms of party list. Uh, during the 17th Congress, I was voted as the senior assistant majority leader and vice chair of the Committee of Youth and Sports on housing, on East Asia growth area, and uh, magko commercial lang ho ako. Please avail of my one of my laws, no? yung pong tax amnesty law. No? Ito pong tax amnesty is only good for two years. So, if uh, this this goes hand in hand with the estate taxes, no, so you can avail of either a two percent or a six two percent of the gross or 
5% of the net. So, avail this. Uh, sayang po itong tax amnesty na to that is given now by the uh, Bureau of uh, BIR. So, ito pong 18th Congress, I was voted as Deputy Speaker and uh, I was the leader of the 51-member party-less coalition block of about 54 congressmen or comprising of, a, of about 20% of Congress. No? As a businessman, I used my, all my negotiation skills no? to ask for uh, the positions of the party list block. No? Just uh, not uh, represented or we were considered second class citizen in Congress. So I decided to put them together, kami mga party list, and to have one voice. And because of that, we got four deputy speakers, 12 chairmanship positions, a position, two positions in the commission on appointments, two, four positions in the powerful rules committee. So because of us bonding together, we got more. In terms of legislation, I have filed about 500 bills during the 17th Congress, of which 32 of my House bills became or was enacted into laws. No? I think this is the, one of the most uh, also. No? Uh, in terms of public service, every year or my last three years, we have helped about 10,000 individuals receive medical assistance. Ito po yung mga heart operation. You know, the difference between being a businessman and a public servant. No? And I experienced this. Pag may humihingi ng tulong sa atin, we can only give help to one, two, three, or ten people in a year, di ba? Kasi medyo very expensive na. And it ranges from medical, educational. No? But being a public servant, you have the full backing of the government. No? And they have, the government has a lot of uh, incentives as well as privileges given to congressmen. So, yung 10 na natutulungan ko, or 20, or even 100, sabi mo ng 100 every year na natutulungan mo as a businessman, it becomes becomes 100 or 1,000 or even 10,000 times. That's why we can help this way as a uh, congressman. Also, in the test the trainings, I have given about 6,000 individuals. And some of the of the individuals having test the trainings, and I'm sure it goes with the other congressmen, is uh, Congressman Romero, nandito na po kami sa Dubai, nandito na po kami sa... sa Sa Hong Kong, nandito na po kami sa Saudi because of the test, the training that you have given us. No? Because the test, the training certifies them to be skilled so they can avail of this. No? And of course, the uh, scholarships and feeding programs. And then, uh, this has been close to my heart when... Uh, we built shelters to about 2,000 itas in Iba Zambales. So, uh, ito ho yung mga tinamaan ng lahar. They were, wala silang matirhan. And then, um, I helped in building their shelter in uh, 2010. Uh, actually, my short message is there are no boundaries to what you can achieve. And my, as the U.S. Speaker Ryan, Paul Ryan once said, the condition of your birth does not determine the outcome of your life. And I go and abide by this saying that uh, is here. Uh, so, 
I will give the floor to my wife to talk about um, the day-to-day -day activities that she does outside of what I do. Thank you. It takes two to tango, they say. For me and Mikey, it takes two to soar and fly. Good afternoon to each and everyone. To the trustees and members of Sheffield, thank you for this honor. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of, like Mikey said, our daughter Milka, our eldest, uh, my parents, and some friends. A whole lot of uh, support group for me today. <laughs> How do... <laughs> How do I begin talking about my journey with somebody whom I carved my life with for 28 years? A journey that has been colorful, multifaceted, and still continuously evolving through the years. Mother to five beautiful children, two girls and three boys, is indeed a blessing from God. As a wife to Mikey, whom I have seen grow from being carpool mates to a successful businessman, sportsman, and now a prime mover in Congress is truly nothing short of exciting. I hope that in sharing our experiences and learnings in both our married life and our careers, that we may inspire and eventually encourage you in whatever way. It is indeed an honor for us to be invited in this forum today with the theme of power couples. Well, power has different connotations, but for us, it is having the ability to direct, the ability to direct and influence people. Power, if used negatively, can also destroy. We believe in the adage that to those who are given much, much is also expected. Being addressed as a power couple, I view power as a tool that I use to inspire and encourage in every positive way that I can. To be able to share my life to different audiences when we are featured in magazines or in forums such as this, talking about overcoming trials probably, or how we've achieved success, if you call it as such. I just hope that at the end of this, we are also able to encourage you as our audience to go out of the box and to live a purpose-driven life. That to me is the, pow is the proper use of power. I always say that Mikey is from Mars, and I am from Venus. I am sub he is very objective. I am very subjective. In business, he always looks at the big picture of revenues, payback, all the bottom line figures. While I try to figure out how to reach that bigger goal, thinking of every little scene and scenario, he takes the lead. I follow. Well, sometimes I don't. <laughs> we brainstorm a lot, having dominant personalities, but we try to understand and get the most of each other's opinions to be able to come up with a compromise. Eventually, the best decision in every scenario is achieved. Sometimes I lead, he follows. I guess it's the mutual respect that we have for each other, knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses, and realizing that the best outcome is far more important. From this, we allow each other to grow in our respective fields of expertise. In business, problems are important to it, but problems are good because they bring out the best in us. I believe that suggestions, comments, and problems in general must be faced head on and not shoved under the rug, 
if you want to improve and give the best to your stakeholders. At the end, no matter how complicated our chats are as husband and wife, we consult each other and untangle all the knots in business, politics, or family to find a solution. Both of us have a very strong background in business. Mikey was both an MBA and a doctorate degree, while I graduated with a double major in applied economics and management of financial institutions in the best university in Manila, <laughs> the De La Salle University. Given this adept abilities to handle Given these adept abilities, I'm able to handle our, perf our por portfolio of investments. It is my responsibility to make our investable funds grow, whether it's land banking, monitoring of the stock market here and globally, monitoring of interest rates of bonds, dealing with emerging market structures, well, and hopefully learning more about options and hedging this year this is part of my everyday routine. I may be the wind beneath his wings, according to him, but trust me when I say that he lets me grow. He trusts me enough to give me the reign of Air Asia as I sit as chairman of FNS Holdings, the majority owner of Air Asia Philippines, and recently as vice chairman of the board of directors of Air Asia Philippines now that he is deeper in politics. He believes that I'm able to run our hotel and restaurant businesses as well as handle these portfolios. I guess he knows that when I run a business, everything is not also about profits. It's also about benefits. Benefits that go to people who are the lifeblood of our labor-intensive businesses, our employees, our customers, and those directly affected by our advocacies. I have been an entrepreneur in the food for 26 years, starting with my food ventures and catering and food kiosks before my first standalone restaurant, Azuro Bistro, back in 99. Being an economist, I believe in calculated risks. Each venture taught me lessons to prepare for me for the bigger ones ahead. When I opened my first restaurant in Glorietta 4, it was the pioneer in Mediterranean food, offering Spanish, French, Italian, and Greek. I was the first one who had a bistro and wine bar in a mall setting. In 2006, when Mikey, bought, Mikey and I bought a property in Katipunan, he gave me his vision, that of a dormitory. We both agreed that it was a business that, as, that is as old as UP and the Ateneo de Manila University. And as long as you have these universities, then the dorm business will always be there. So he laid out the financials, the target income, the IRR he wanted, and he told me to do the rest of the legwork. I did the market study and the strategic plans, sourced the architects, contractor, and built the five-story building. It was a mixed-use property development then, where I leased the commercial spaces in the front, and we had the dorm at the back. Business was very good, very good, and soon, Oracle Hotel and Residences was born in 2011. We expanded the property to build the only boutique hotel in the university belt from the fifth floor to the 11th floor. It caters to government, corporate, and also school events. In 2012, when my daughter Milka was in third year college, Roku Sushi and Ramen was established. Working with my eldest in the food business became exciting again. Passing on the knowledge and expertise to one of my children has always been a dream. It is my legacy, having been in the food business for 26 years, to see my daughter successful and happy to be in the same industry. Through this, we have strengthened our mother and daughter bonding, bonding and not just spend time on trivial things. We consistently have date nights, half of which she consults, and half is just having fun with her siblings. 
Sushi Nori, which is her brainchild, and an offshoot of Roku has now eight branches. The best achievement, I guess, for a mother is to see her children successful and independent. Roku Group today has grown with over 200 employees, with Naratai being my latest brand to add in 2018. Naratai Cuisine is a franchise from Bangkok and the Philippines, which is the seventh country in Asia, including Taiwan, Singapore, India, Vietnam, and others. After a year in the mega fashion branch, we were awarded the Thai Select Award by the, Thai, by the Thailand Trade and Industry. It is like the Michelin Award given internationally to recognize restaurants and products made from Thailand that are truly authentic. By the end of October this year, my second branch of NARA will open at the Ayala, Manila Bay. And by February 2020, you can spend Valentine's with us in Greenbelt 5. Our mission is not, to gr not only to grow and be profitable, but to create a healthy and happy work environment that emphasize in career and personal growth for our employees. This is the main reason why ever since I started in the restaurant business, I believed in having regular contractual employees. By giving them the assurance of a long-term job, this will create motivation, which will translate to better performance. My employees benefit because of our on-time payments of their government mandatories. So they get to loan and enjoy the benefits given by the government. We do quarterly evaluations of the staff to make sure that their growth is monitored and remunerated. We also give them free medical insurance and subsidies for housing as part of their benefits. Through intense regular trainings, we recognize that our biggest asset is our employees. We organically develop individuals to be the best that they can be, giving them annual corporate outings and corporate plannings to foster camaraderie. It also gives me immense joy every time I listen to customers, our stakeholders, through comment cards and our dedicated customer service line where they can text their concerns as well as praise our staff and management I'm able to get their feedback. We take this seriously because every suggestion is a source of wisdom to improve. We listen to our customers, especially the regulars, who mean well. After all, the customer is always right. To benefit our stakeholders, I make sure that we are flexible and know where the restaurant industry is headed. I am blessed to have the opportunity to travel and witness the fast-paced evolution in the food industry. I'm able to constantly do research and development to be updated and be at par with the global innovations. In 2010, with the Air Asia Burhad Group, Mr. Kawanko and Man on Tiveres, Mighty started Air in Asia Philippines. Today, it is expected to increase its revenue by 32% to 30 billion year to date. Last June, Air Asia won the world's best low cost airline for the 11th year at the prestigious SkyTrax World Awards, Airline Awards 2019. The SkyTrax World Airline Award are considered the global benchmark of airline excellence. This year's results were decided by a survey of 21 million customers. Air Asia is committed to provide affordable travel and guest-obsessed service. These awards are based on direct feedback and is really a milestone to recognize all the employees who put so much effort and commitment into service excellence for our guests. As chairman of our holdings group, and Vice Chair of the Board of Air Asia, my role is not only to oversee our increase in revenues, but also to amplify customer satisfaction. I am a woman who works in details, so I expect me to envision a passenger from the time he books his ticket to the point that he takes his flight up to his disembarkation. The board should ensure that all the policies and goals we create are also in line 
with our employees and our customers' needs. Budget means hard-earned money. So we make sure that the customers get the best service that we can offer. On-time performance is crucial in the airline business. I am very proud that we're able to improve and get a high rating on being on time. This reflected numbers showing in the increase in our 91% load factor that is our competitive advantage over other airlines. We have a 24-7 customer satisfaction online link as well as a customer hotline for us, for us to, act, to act on their concerns swiftly. In the region, they recently implemented the AI or artificial intelligence. The customer through chatbot can inquire on flights, check in, or discuss customer concerns. The addition, the addition of Osaka to our international destination. And by October this year, we will be launching Bacolod. This brings to 21 our domestic routes and 31 for the international flights. By the end of the year, we, we will also add seven new planes, so expect more interesting destinations from Air Asia. Our business endeavors serve their purpose to us, to our 2,000 employees, to our customers, and also to our customers. But in the process of inclusivity, we ought to serve the community. And this is how I Want to Share Foundation was created. It is with the purpose of giving back. To take up an advocacy is to be responsible for other people's lives. These are lives that are hard up, fragile, helpless. When these lives feel that hope has abandoned them, a flicker of light comes in. To be able to bring like-minded individuals to pursue a dream to make a positive impact in the lives of others, especially those who are marginalized, is I Want to Share Foundation. joy and service, and the yearning to give and make a difference in this competitive world. It was our goal to encourage friends to not only share their resources, but to join us in our quest to go beyond giving, but actually getting to know the children whom they've supported through their donations.
become a channel of blessings. Because for those who are given much, much is also expected. Through our collective action, we have given out educational scholarships to deserving students in the Philippine Science High School and have supported other charitable institutions such as EPCOM, I Can Serve Foundation, and Bright Halls Foundation. I want to encourage my friends to go out of their comfort zone. Charity is not just giving out a check that you've done your, and say that you've done your share for the year. It is actually donating your time, which is more valuable by getting involved in our feeding programs, visiting the sick, and exposing our children to humanitarian no, no, work. No, no, no. In December 2016, we partnered with the PGH, Pediatric Hematology Oncology Department, to fund the medical needs of indigent children with cancer. We are able to raise funds through an annual shine, Dreams Do Come True. We encourage friends and family not only to donate, but to have their children participate in the program with the kids. Because of the funds that are readily available, tests and medicines that are done outside of PGH, there's been an increased rate of early detection of cancer. Survival has increased and the best chance of treatment is thus administered. On the average, there are 300 cases of pediatric cancer in PGH. Last year, there were 120 kids who graduated Chemotherapy. Hence, joie de vivre, or the joy of life, which is actually a graduation of the kids free from cancer, was born. This October, we will again have this commemoration with 100 kids on remission. Like graduates, they wore togas, marched on the stage, and received diplomas. Winning against cancer is one feat that deserves to be celebrated. Last July, together with the Salcedo auctions, we mounted an art auction. We were able to raise over five million by tapping friends in the industry, the art industry, and other art patrons to sell this portion to, to the foundation. Aside from the medical assistance, the program also supports therapy classes for the kids, funds to provide for the caregivers, which PGH doesn't have, even Wi-Fi. The project will also renovate the chemo isolation ward of the PGH. From, from the first picture on your left to a hotel looking like ward, hopefully it's my dream to transform the whole of PGH. We will also build a new, out, thank you, a new outpatient blood extraction unit that will help reduce the, the infection rate and would again contribute to the early detection and treatment of patients. Our shareholders at the foundation, the beneficiaries of our projects, help make us better individuals. Through these works, we're able to find meaning in our existence as we help rebuild lives. We work hard because we want to give them courage and hope to believe that they will live. My advocacy is not work at all, it's a devotion. It makes me feel complete as a woman, a wife, a mother, and a citizen of this country. In life, there are no shortcuts to success. It entails a lot of hard work, determination, passion, and prayers. Mighty is a conduit in all these. Our children, because they're exposed to this advocacy act, do not feel entitled or privileged. They enjoy the comforts of life, but they are also conscious about the discomfort of others. The world is our children's classroom when it comes to learning about life. They say that it takes two to tango. Mike and I have proven that. But in our dance, we have also invited others to participate so we can all soar and fly. Thank you so much. This moderator really needs no introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, as moderator for the panel discussion, may I introduce dear friend, Da, Da, Miss Karen Davila.
And can we ask uh, our two other power couples, uh, Mayor, Mayor and Congressman, and Chris and Annette, to please join. The public, the public, or the audience can ask questions uh, later, depending on how moderator reacts. And please stay to claim your 19 tickets. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Are you still up? Yes. All right. Well, we just have 30 or 40 minutes to go, but it's no doubt that everyone in the panel is an achiever. I don't think that's the issue anymore. We all know that. We have billionaires with us on stage. I don't know, except for Bayani. Should I call you a billionaire? Uh, all right, but uh, today's panel... I'll go straight to the point. Today's panel is how power couples manage their stakeholders. So let's ask some questions that perhaps were not addressed in the presentation. I'll start with Mikey and Sheila, no? I mean, you were a businessman, you are a businessman, you are a billionaire of a businessman, and yet you decided to go into politics. A, a party list that supposedly, that essentially is for the marginalized sector. If it's the stakeholder, who is your prime stakeholder? Is it your shareholders in business? I mean, business is about profit. And yet, as a politician, you have a different group of constituency and stakeholders. What happens when one is towards the other? Who is more important to you? Is it your business stakeholders, or frankly speaking, the marginalized who may not be able to benefit from some business decisions you'd have to make? Yeah, actually, uh, I wear two hats now, no? as a businessman and a, as a corporate man and a uh, public servant. Uh, I think it gives you a sense of uh, of uh, yung iniisip mo na ngayon yung kapakanan ng bansa no? yung kapakanan ng bawat no? I am a pro-poverty uh, congressman what what does it mean? No? Uh, I have espoused the unconditional cash transfers my, my advocacy is how to bring poverty the, tw the Philippines has a 23% below poverty line Filipinos. What does it mean? It means two or three Filipinos that you see outside does not eat three times a day. So it's my advocacy. That's why my bill or my laws are centered to anti-poverty reduction or anti-poverty uh, campaign. No? But my question was who's more important? your stakeholders in business, or is it the stakeholders of one Pac-Man party list? Right now... What won't you cross in business that may not benefit them? Right now, it's not conflicted. I have the consumers for the airline, consumers for the electricity, and it goes hand in hand with, with uh, the business, or the consumer to, to the C2, uh, the business to consumer type of... Uh, relationship, wherein my role as a public servant is really how to serve and how to eradicate uh, poverty in the country. No? From 23% in three years, I want it down to about 14%. So it's really not conflicted with each other. All right, I'll continue with that later on. With Bayani and Marines, uh, clearly you are the power couple in Marikina. And uh, you do run a construction company at this point. Is there any point where you felt that business and public service shouldn't mix? If you're running the city and you own a business, when are the lines crossed? Have you ever closed a deal wherein it was your construction company that benefited? These are the questions that are hard for stakeholders and families in power. Uh, it has been our policy not to get any contracts where there is a conflict of interest. 
First of all, uh, it's against the law, and uh, we don't want to be in a position where our values will be compromised. Uh, in uh, Marikina, we don't do any contracts with the city government. Uh, I think we, you have to give them a hand for that too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so easy to, for people to find out no? when there are conflicts of interest. So you don't want to get into that situation. Uh, also, we would rather be doing work for private sector when there's, because the business is quite robust now, there's a lot of opportunities there. And what we like to do now is hire from Marikina for projects outside of our city. So it, it, we're able to give jobs to the Marikenos where before perhaps they didn't have opportunities. And uh, because of the discipline that we had instilled, it's so much easier to manage now these people because they trained na sila. I may add to that. Uh, actually, we were the second PPP uh, signed in this country and the first PPP to be completed. No? And now we are doing the common station of the MRT, LRT. And all this work, well, we got them to competitive bidding. And uh, there's no conflict at all. The only conflict is time. We have to devote time for business, and we have to devote time for uh, our constituency. Uh, right now, Congress is so busy dealing with the budget. No? I should be there. <laughs> but that's the conflict of time. Oh, that's the conflict of time. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, with Chris and Nanette. Uh, Nanette has made uh, clearly a name for herself when it comes to hope. And I think that she's chosen to make a stand in advocating a plastic-free neutral, considering it's a profitable business. And yet your husband is in a consumer business, so to speak, that deals with a lot of plastic. I mean, I'm sure you have Hunt's sachet, it's in plastic, the bottles. I'm curious how you both deal with that in terms of where you stand in values of companies should deal with plastic better, and how you in Century and Shakey's, et cetera, have to tell Nanette, you know, we have to make a profit and plastic is cheap. What's the middle ground? Um, well, the, I'm a believer in what um, Nanette does in the plastic exchange. So we are actually one of the first companies to declare ourselves also plastic neutral. So Century, Pacific Food, and Shakey's by the end of this year will be plastic neutral in the same way that Hope is plastic neutral. So she connected us to um, uh, Republic Cement uh, where we negotiated a, um, an arrangement where uh, we, the Century and Shakey's together, um, we put out about 23,000 tons of consumer, of consumer plastic a year you know, into the market. So um, by the end of this year, we would have worked with Republic to collect the same amount at our cost so that both companies can be plastic neutral. No? Do you want to add, Nanette? No, uh, so uh, basically Chris has laid it out. No, I don't think it, there's necessarily a conflict. And I think that um, as a business person myself, I understand the, 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 the push and pull between profitability and and um, uh, being responsible stewards, right? So uh, Chris and I talked about it. I, I would have never as a spouse you know, insisted because I understand he also has responsibility to shareholders. But what we looked at very carefully was what was the cost, right? And to make sure that uh, the, the kinds of solutions we were offering um, were affordable and were valued by the people. I'm sure the shareholders of Century and as well as Shakey's very much appreciate that um, the company's efforts towards sustainability are, are concrete and does not highly affect profitability. All right, what is the role or how important is the role of a wife? I mean, it's often said that the success of a man is really who he's married to. I don't know if it's literal, but does it really matter? I want to ask Sheila, being married to someone like Mikey, 
you know, who's um, very aggressive in business and is very active in politics, what is your role and what is your say in the company? Do you have a boundary of, I'm going to leave this to my husband? Or how do you express who you are as an equal? And I'll ask, of course, our other, the wives in the panel. You are vice chair right now of Air Asia, am I right? Yes, okay. Good afternoon, yeah. Karen. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, it's not really easy being a wife of a politician. Mm -hmm. However, um, since I have the liberty of time, so to speak, since we, I, I have my own businesses, then it's like an example is like you will say, tomorrow there's a board meeting in the house. There's lunch with my um, fellow congressman. Mm -hmm. And he just thinks that I'm a Wonder Woman. That you can just whip, change your schedule, mm -hmm. um, uh, whip up a, a menu for, for 10, mm -hmm. and that's it. So, but again, I said, first and foremost, I am a mother and, and a wife. Mm -hmm. So, everything is, is um, held back if our, our, I need to bring my, my son to the doctor try to bring my, our youngest yes. who's three years old to school. That has always been a priority. But of course, like I said, um, he, we respect each other's expertise. We respect each other's space to grow. But then again, I always consult him and probably he also um, seeks my opinion, even if at the end of the day, he still um, uh, has the last say. But. I, I, um, I'm appreciative of the fact that even when he talks about politics, that he shares a lot with me. Okay. What about Marides and Bayani? You seem to be, I mean, you know, you were both mayor at one point. So who has the last say? And do you, <laughs> all right, you're going to be like Chris. No, but so she has the last say. But how important is it to listen to each other's point of view or let's say, a decision that has to be made in the city of Marikina? Well, in the city of Marikina, we, each of us had we, our own time to, mm -hmm. to, yeah. uh, to, to lead, not to be mayor. So, but do you always have the same? I mean, uh, you don't. Yeah. I think that's important. I left yeah. everything to her in, in her time as mayor. Because I was so busy with the MMDA. Yeah, but did you ever tell her, you know, what you did was wrong? No, she will never accept that. Ah, okay. <laughs> what about her? Did you ever tell him, you know what, Bayani, the problem with you is this. I mean, how are power couples made of, right, in terms of the balance of power? Well, during Bayani's time, yeah. I was a sportive wife. Okay. And I needed to neutralize his, uh, his aggressive stance. Mm -hmm. no? So I was more the person who was going to the communities, dealing with the women, dealing with the marginalized, and he was mm -hmm. the one, you know, driving the bulldozer to clean the streets of Marikina. Mm -hmm. But when I became mayor, I told him, I cannot do your style. Mm -hmm. no? I have to do my own style. Mm -hmm. So I managed my way. Mm -hmm. And it's okay for him because he wasn't busy. Mm -hmm. Good thing when he became chairman of MMDA, because during the start of his term, he didn't want to leave his chair. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. But he, he thought he was still mayor. Until yeah. after a while, and I said, Dad, I can't work under your shadow. Uh oh. So, I'm curious, Mikey, you didn't get to speak. Does your wife have strong opinions with politics? I mean, especially in voting for a speaker, where you stood being the head of the party list coalition. Uh -huh. Did she say, like, Mikey, what are you doing? All the time. Ah, okay. <laughs> and then do you listen, follow? What's well, the line? Actually, uh, we bounce ideas with each other, no? Uh, tama ba itong ginagawa ko? O kaya, nako, alam mo, nagkamali yata ako dito sa decision na to. You know, uh, she has been my conscience and uh, uh, she puts me in the right direction most of the time, no? Uh, although, I'm, siguro I'm aggressive both in business and politics, but she has kept me grounded and... Uh, Are you under at home? Under? No, she, uh, 
Nag-twist kasi sa sabi niya, in, under ako, Karen. In, in, Simple lang. In business and politics, I'm very aggressive. Okay. But pagdating ko sa bahay, I have to abide. Yeah. Okay. Now, interestingly, I was gonna say, Nanette and Chris, um, they're a couple I know well. We've been in the beach together, so dinners together. So I'm very familiar with Nanette specifically. And Nanette has very strong ideas, even in business. You'll be surprised that her ideas are actually carried on in the company to make her the Poe Family, um, family Council, council Chairperson, being an in-law, a woman, that of a Chinese company, would mean that she's respected for her own point of view and how she maneuvers herself in the company. So when it comes to Nanette, how far does she go in terms of suggesting for Century Tuna, Shakey's, etc.? Yeah, so the family council is separate from the company, no? So the company has the board of directors, etc., and then management. So the family council is primarily a po family governance structure. You know? So those, those things are separate. But having said that, um, uh, I have to make a lot of important decisions on strategy, uh, allocating capital on people, uh, even day-to-day -day, even day -to -day, um, uh, decisions. No? So I use her as my closest advisor. No? Um, I may not necessarily listen to what I mean, I may not necessarily take the advice that she, she gives me, but she does give me her advice, and um, I value it very much. You know? um, it's, a, it's, um, it's a cliche. Uh, earlier you said that uh, a man, uh, the most important decision they make is uh, uh, the, who they marry. You know? So in my case, I, you know, in front of everyone, in front of my wife, I'll say, I won the wife lottery. Max, fairness. So, <laughs> I'm so lucky that it turned out this way. You know, that uh, she's a great mother, and when she takes care of the home, I can focus my. Of course, I'm you know I'm there for the kids. I'm there for her. I have family responsibilities. But if the home is stable, then I can also be focused um, and channel my energies towards business. You know? So. Um, it, I guess we work together on, on many levels, right? Um, on the business side, it's informal advice. On, um, uh, on the philanthropy side, you know, I, I do get involved um, in some of the things that she does and, and vice versa. And then on the personal and then on the family side, you know, we spoke about uh, the family council. So it, it op we operate together on many levels. Yeah. What, 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 no, just um, to weigh in on your point on Century and how much input, no? Part of the job of the family council is to establish rules, no? Because you'll not always have spouses or uh, that, that are necessarily helpful, right? So there's a very clear distinction between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So whenever people say, do you work for Century? And I know I told you this before at the beach. I said, no, I don't work for Century. I work for Crispo Inc. <laughs> because that should be the boundary, right? Whether or not he decides to use any sort of, uh, you know, we, we use each other as sounding boards. If he decides to use that advice or not, it's completely up to him, but that's the limit. Now, the, the dark side of uh, being a power couple is not all power couples live happily ever after every day. There's also the problem of competition with So I'll ask first Bayani and Marides, no? I mean, be honest. Were you ever competitive with each other at any point in time? Up uh, there. Uh, uh, okay. So, I mean, when I say competition, it's like, I mean, we're all human and we want to be our best selves. But when you have a spouse that's performing quite well, there's a part of you na ayo mo maiwan. You want to shine as well. I mean, was there any point that you felt competitive towards each other. No, no, no. But uh, we are a board of three. No? My wife, me, and my, our daughter. I'm, a, I'm always outvoted. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I've learned earlier in life, I'm much older than, uh, than the other. And so I, I learned to say, yes, dear. <laughs> but you know, you're saying this now. But then I'm curious, Marides. <laughs> this is competition between power couples 
Is it real? I I see it in some some other couples, but in our case, maybe because I uh, was not really born into a political family, and so um, I thought that I'll be in office only for three years, and then he would come back to finish the work in Marikina. But I I had to stay for nine years. I wasn't really. Uh, competing in terms of popularity or more work done. It's just that the style of doing things was different because, you know, his style is different and my style is maybe a little more uh, softer, gentler, you know, more more uh, like a teacher, mother for the city. So I think, uh, you know, different styles. I'm curious very briefly, since yes. you're a power couple in politics, do you believe that the anti-dynasty law is better for the Filipino people than let's say, I'm, I'm not saying it's both of you, you both performed well, but you're seeing problems in other parts of the Philippines. If the husband has already expired his term, he let his wife run or his daughter run, are you for the anti-dynasty bill? Can I, can I just share something? Because you know our family has been there for 18 years in Marikina and people say that's is that dynasty, no? But you know, the reason that there's dynasties is because you want to, to propagate or to continue with the programs that you've already invested so much time of your life in. And the only way that we can really continue with programs is if we have strong political parties, which we do not have in this country. Unfortunately, that is the answer to political dynasties, because that's the only other way that your programs will continue. Because isn't it so frustrating to put policies in place for three years just to have it reversed after years? You know, nobody wants to waste their time and energy building up something that somebody else will destroy. You know, fortunately in Marikina, 18 years changed character. If, they, if we didn't change the people's attitude there, it would probably be so sad for me now to think that Marikina is back to dirty, basura, and everything. No? Okay, quickly, you want to answer that? Would you vote for the anti-political uh, dynasty uh, bill? This family dynasty, some, some good points. No? I mean, and anti least, or pro? pro uh, depends. Uh, uh, but uh, at, at least, uh, at least if you are born in a uh, political family, you have a good background. Mm. Yeah. Because there are so many people who get into power by chance, by sheer luck, or probably got into, voted for one bright idea. But when, when a policy, when, when a, a public servant uh, sees to, to have new ideas, mm. huh, then he begins to do the same as every politician. Becomes the politician's mm. way, okay? Kaya, like what I said earlier in my uh, delivery, my, my in my speech, I started off with what I learned from my father. He was mayor for at least 42 years before mm. my time. It's not really a dynasty, but I learned much from mm. him. Okay. And then that uh, was the basis uh, where I started. Mm. Uh, now, Mikey and Sheila, in terms of competition, I mean, Sheila, you're seeing that your husband, I mean, clearly you have a great marriage, but your husband's becoming more popular, more visible, you know, running this billion dollar business. Is there pressure on your end to keep up? Is this a reality with power couples? Because everybody always talks about the gloss of it, but then the day-to-day -day living with a powerful man, and you are focused on your family, you do run a restaurant, your restaurant businesses, but did you at any point feel that pressure? Um, I wanted to say that at the end of the day, whatever happens in the boardroom or in our businesses, that's not the priority for me. It's our family, our relationship, our marriage. At the end of the day, it's recognizing that that is the priority. Otherwise, I just try to do my best. And whatever mandate that he tells me to, like early this year, okay, I think you're ready. Sit in the board and I'll just guide you through. I'm just trying to do my best. Um, in, in whatever I do. And 
to be honest, um, I've always regarded him as the breadwinner of the family, that whatever is his, is mine, and mine is okay. mine. <laughs> Whatever is his is mine. Is and that, what's what mine is what mine. Is mine is mine and what I is his agree. is mine. So I guess that could be a rule, right? Okay. No, but then Mikey, are you conscious? I mean, are you conscious as a husband that that you'd have to kind of keep the balance to make sure what's it like in, in everyday life? First uh I mean you have a lot of women like, you know, all after you in Congress. Well, first of all, I would like to answer your competitiveness. No? Yes, because yeah. our life has been very competitive with each other. No? Every day. No? Every day, com very competitive kami. Bakit? Kasi parati namin sinasabi, we always talk about, sino bang mas kamukha mo anak? Daddy mo o mami mo? So, and then, of course, we always ask our children, sino ba favorite mo? Mami mo, daddy mo. So that's the competition that we have every day now. We have five children, uh, the eldest being here, 26 years old. And the youngest, fortunately, we have a three-year-old. Kaya very competitive kami doon. No? But uh, uh, outside of those competition, we more or less complement each other, mm -mm. more than be competitive. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I gave them everything. Yeah? <laughs> I gave them to my daughter and to her, to my wife, and I uh, have a very limited budget to Galiban. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, that's a good one. Uh -uh. So, so she knows, no? Alam niya, the pera that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. lalaki, give them a credit card para the wife can see. I don't, I don't use the credit card. <laughs> yeah, there's a record. Yeah, there's a record and credit card. Uh -oh. Okay, Marites, I mean, clearly, what do you think is the secret all these years that, you know, your marriage was never sacrificed, even after all the temptations that surround politicians? Okay, um, early on, we, we set guide, guidelines, yes, you know, one. rules, you know, like... Like written rules? I like no, that. No, we just talked about it okay. and said, okay, no checking in wallets, no checking cell phones, uh, privacy what? for one another. Mm -hmm. So but he can't can check yours? No, he cannot. Okay. But he doesn't. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. But uh, why no checking? I think it's more for privacy, like you have your own life. I have uh, in, in the sense that you respect, you know, his... Mm -hmm. Privacy, okay. no. So that's uh, that's one. Trust. Okay, trust. And uh, if there are issues, then we discuss it. I take it up with him. If there are, you know, things I hear, mm -hmm. you know, which will happen in Meron politics. Meron may things you hear. Yeah, of course. There's always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take, take it. Things you hear. Uh oh. Uh oh. There are always intrigues in politics. Yes. Uh -oh. And. Uh, I think many political wives will tell you, you know, that, you know, inevitably during the course, you know, even as mayor, like mm -hmm. this, because as you say, you know, people will try to tempt. And if they can't get to uh, your good side, they'll get to your bad side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of uh, challenges in that respect. All right, thank you. Any other questions, sir? The last, oh wait, sir, there's a woman at the back. Can you give us your name? You'd have to be. No, she was standing a while ago. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I appreciate all your talks. Thank you so much for the inspiration. Um, I actually have two questions. I hope that you can accommodate both. So for first is for Ms. Um, Mary Des. Um, what advice would you give to a student for me um, who is not interested in entering politics but is willing to make a difference? Specifically, what advice can you give me to improve the culture on pedestrians in Katipunan? Um, yeah, <laughs> so it's one by one. First okay, question. Yeah. Okay, in terms of what you can do, there are many things that ordinary citizens can do. One is to be proactive in complaining. Complain to your local government, call 888, make some bong, everything you see, take pictures of the basura around you and post it. Tell them well, there's this garbage pile here on this boulevard. There's this garbage pile here on this corner. Mm -hmm. There's unruly people on this corner. 
you know, just be so sumbungero, you know, and let the government try to do their work. The problem with many times, when we started out in Marikina, nobody would even yeah. make sumbung. Nobody would call the government's attention because they feel like it's, well, nothing will happen anyway. But no, I believe that things will happen. And especially with 888, I don't know if people here, anybody in this room has called that number for President Duterte, but I'll tell you, people in government are afraid of that number. People don't want to be called attention to, they don't want to be cited, they don't want their names involved in any uh, uh, such obnoxious uh, reports. And so government is uh, firing people on account of non-answering of uh, 888 responses. So I think if everybody would just make it a habit every day to take a picture, post it in Facebook, tell them where it is, uh, send the report to 888, I think things will happen in this Philippines. All right, very good. Do you have another question? Thank you. Yes, I actually do. Um, sorry. Um, for Ms. Nanette Po, okay. um, how does HOPE intend to push for creating, um, sorry, does HOPE intend to push for creating biodegradable plastic in the next few years for substituting current plastic neutrality um, to be more efficient way to reduce plastic? Yeah, um, biodegradable plastic is already in the Philippines, but it's not applicable. It doesn't have applications across all substitutions, no? So I think there are already a lot of companies who offer biodegradable, you know, spoons and forks and, and takeaway packaging. So it is available here. It's just not applicable. Let's say in our, in our case with water, you can't use that for water. Um, so what we have been trying to, we've been, we applied many, many years ago and still have not gotten a, approval for is 100% uh, RPET. Um, but that still, yeah, is recycle, uh, recycled plastic. But that still doesn't solve the plastic problem because even when something is recycled, end of life plastic is not dealt with, which is why we came up with the plastic exchange which deals with end of life plastic. All right, but thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You. And uh, the gentleman in front, sir, would you want to ask one question? Perhaps the last question. Uh, thank you. I think we have here examples of power couples who have been able to be successful in their careers, businesses, because they operate separately from each other. Uh, each one in, the, in each of the couples has its, his or her own space, okay? So the question is, you think if you are working within the same space, for example, you're both working in the same Century Tuna business, yeah, yeah. both of you, or uh, in the case of uh, Mikey it, yeah. and Sheila, they're both working in Asia Air, uh, I mean, in an operating capacity, and same with well, Marides and Bayani, they were mayors at different times, you know. And now, while Marides is taking care of the construction business, uh, Bayani is back in Congress. You think the story will remain the same in terms of uh, being able to be together in the same space and yet be able to maintain the good relationship you have as husband and wife? Okay, very quickly, Mikey and Sheila, would you get along if you were frankly doing, working together? I think yes, no? Uh, but there should be boundaries. Kasi pagka sa bahay, if you go home and you still talk about the business and you sleep, you know, habang natutulog ka, your wife will tell you, alam mo, dapat yung maintenance nung ano, ganito lang ginastos mo. <laughs> alam mo, dapat yung marketing plan natin, ganyan. Then, mahihirapan, aawain ko na siya. Gusto ko na matulog, no? <laughs> So there must be a, uh, uh, we can work together as long as there's a demarcation. Meaning, uh, Sheila, pagka 9 to 5, pwede tayo mag-usap ng trabaho. 6 to 12, let me sleep or let me relax. So maybe those are the conditions or precondition to, to what working together means. No? But uh, as I said, we have complemented each other through time and we... We will remain complementary to each other, right? Thank All right. Marides and Bayani, would you get along if you were working 
together in City Hall at the same time, your desks up, apart from each other. Never had such an encounter. Or, uh, but uh, actually in business, I think who, who, he, he who holds the purse is the boss. He who holds the gold rules. Yeah. He holds the purse. <laughs> Uh, at least I know where I uh, where I stand, you know. So there should be no, no. I uh, accept to her. I, I respect her judgment uh, after everything, no. And no, no. I, I really learned how to say yes, dear. Okay. <laughs> All right. With Nanette and Chris, if you were working together, I mean, you were in the states at one point. You lived abroad at one point. But you weren't working in the same office. You know what I mean? Would you get along? Uh, yeah, well, um, we do work together. Um, we raise our two kids. No, nah. it's, no, it's true. It's, yeah, okay. it's our most important. I mean, it's, it's not BS, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's a day to day uh, ground war, right? Yeah. I mean, trying to um, make sure that the kids are mm -hmm. you know grow up to be uh, good people. Um, and there, there, there's no for us. There's no boundaries. It could be like. 11 in the evening, she mm -hmm. wants to talk about our son, okay. I want to talk about uh -uh. You know, an issue. But work, um, what about but, work? So uh, work, we do work together. Uh, so I am on her board, I am mm -hmm. on the board of uh, Hope. And then um, uh, even if she officially is not working at any of our companies, um, she does give me advice, no? so it's that. But I think that I, I would very much per personally welcome her working with me yeah um if if our tables can be together um in an office that'll be great however oh the complicated, the legal, like, the complicating i have a couple thing, of friends they work together they almost got a divorce the the complicating yeah. thing is no because we we work i think we work well together the complicating okay. thing is we operate in a we don't operate in a vacuum no there's a larger context there are managers there are other shareholders. Mm -hmm. Number one, optics-wise, it looks bad, right? Uh -oh. That you know the husband and the wife of you know public listed company yeah. are kind yeah. of you know in the same office. Yeah, yeah. And then and then there's also in the complicating same. factor of fa family, other family members who are on the board, and then also executives. You know? So um, that's why we we there there we have that boundary. You know? But uh, otherwise, I would very much welcome. Um, her to come because she, uh, for a good part of my working life, uh, she was doing all of this thing, all of these things for me uh, for free, mm -hmm. and uh, she was very effective at it. Mikey, what do you want to say to your wife? <laughs> this is how we end the panel, short and sweet. <laughs> Over. I told them to practice. Go, go, Mikey. What do you want to say to your wife? Well, uh, well, first of all, thank you for giving me five children. They have all been, uh, uh, of course, the life uh, of our marriage. And salamat sa pagiging, for being the rock. Actually, she's the rock behind our marriage no she has put the things together mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that and uh, may you continue to uh, no, may, may you continue to uh, be more resilient with me uh, okay <laughs> all right now I, i'm gonna have bayani last chris what would you want to say to nanette that you haven't said yet every day no i I uh, I start my day very early, usually yeah. before 5 a.m. And when I get up, she wakes up because she's a light sleeper. And the first thing I tell her when I wake up is, thank you very much for everything that you do. Every day? Every day. Over? The first thing every I say. Day, every day, Pagisay, thank you so day, much. Including this Ganon. morning, yes. Thank you very much for everything that you do. Grabe ka naman. Every day, to wala palya. Every day, ha? Talaga? Ang sweet. Oh. Okay, to close the session, Bayani, yeah. what do you want to say to Mama. Maribes? Yeah, Mama, uh, don't put to heart uh, or don't believe everything that I've said today. <laughs> <laughs> ano, dapat may, yun na yun. 
Meron kang what do you want to say as we close? <laughs> well, <laughs> we've been together for too long, you know? <laughs> you need that in a, uh, on I a said sweet every, note. Everything, everything nice to, to her, no? Remember, she, she's 12 years my junior, no? 12 years my junior. So, uh, well, that's the beauty of having a younger wife and an older husband, no? So, <laughs> I can always forgive her. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm old enough to understand and forgive her. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you to our panelists. It's a hand gesture sculpture. There, it's a hand gesture sculpture. It's a hand signal for okay among divers. But also means money on some occasions, okay? So, while they are posing for a picture, can I just share with you my takeout for today's session? Husbands have the last word, and they have their wives' permission to say so. When all else fails, since there is no divorce law in the Philippines, my advice just poison your husband's <laughs> coffee. Okay? With that, we congratulate our power couples here and uh, the marriage vows till death do we part in sickness and in health and all that jazz. <laughs> I think in the situation of this, it holds true. So, uh, we are believers in power couples, but most of that, we are believers in respect. Respect for each other. Respect for human dignity, regardless of gender, regardless of political beliefs, and regardless of other people's opinions. Stay together, keep powerful. This is your host, Attorney Lorna Patao Kapunan. Don't go away. We are raffling 19 tickets. <laughs> and can we call on the board of directors, please, of Sheriff Phil? The city hall is the most important place 
next to the church. But it's not as simple as that. We, the citizens, we need to get respect for City Hall only if we have people like you in City Hall. Otherwise, Baran Kalenia, and we have seen it to happen. So, from sharing your kudos to both of you for making what Marajida is now today. I think I'm involved in the National Competitiveness Council, and I know how Marajida has done a lot to be a showcase for the other cities and other NGOs to be done. On accountability, I think, I think what also Paridel said, constancy and consistency in the first kind of laws, in short, discipline is very important. Performance based on targets or performance against targets should be set and should be imposed and followed. And I think I, I, I don't know if I heard you right, but uh, right when you said that you let your employees go if then they don't measure up. I think that's very important because it's no secret that in this country people are kept in their job no matter how poor they perform. Chris Paul, I think, said or even went to the extent of making the public council run like a company with committees. It is the, in his own words, it is lack of communication among public members that is to be blamed in no small measure for the failure of our companies to go past the third generation. And I think, and I think there's something new that Chris and Annette has introduced in the public council. I think Annette was the first in-law woman of that to be made a family, the chairman of the public council. I think coming from a Chinese family, that's unheard of. And I think that this should serve also as a model for others because as one of the speakers said, you know, power, I think it was Sheila who said, power can destroy, but power is properly used, means the ability to direct and influence people. And if you think of it, it all starts with the family. Okay? No matter how good the educational system is, no matter how good the government is, if we lack that foundation in ourselves, our families, we will have to work harder and harder for in order to effect the change that we all need in this country. Caring and sharing, I think, is the overall theme of this conference. We may be a successful in business as our speakers, but if you don't care for society, if you don't share like what Hope and Annette and Chris have, and um, I want to change, I think, Sheila and, um, and are doing, you don't, in the words of Sheila, so I report correctly, find real meaning in our existence. Okay? So, Sheerfield also started as an organization that was focused on shareholders' rights. I think it's about it. I think it was trusty Cora who said that we, I think, early on, the revised corporation, uh, corporate governance has been revised, shared in budget for the revival of stakeholder interest as the centerpiece of good corporate governance. It's that for the corporate governance that is started with stakeholder, I think I think the president is here, Fred, 
that we went back to stakeholder in uh, the spring 2001 when the the body when the corporation board uh, when the corporate board of corporate governance was revised and now stakeholder interest has been a big part of the stadium when the corporation board was revised which was made effective in I think February of this year. When trustee BB and I were interviewed in AAMC, we were asked a question, and I think the question was also asked by Rob. Is there any consistency between shareholder interest and stakeholder interest? And our answer was no. Because if you take care of your stakeholders, which is the bigger body, we also necessarily will uh, will uh, avoid that companies and will have the result of having the shareholder and higher shareholder interest. So we are here now and I'm glad that the law has um, embedded permanently stakeholder because after all we are not here only for ourselves, for our families, but for the greater good of our society. I'd like to thank our sponsors, without whose continuing support through the years, Sheriffville would not have been what it is today. We have a lot of institutional investors, the SM Group of Company, the FDIC, MVP group of companies, the Lushatan group of companies, the San Miguel group, all big corporates. And you may be asking the question, why is Sheriff getting the support of the government? Is that not contrary to the interest of minority shareholders? And our answer is no. Because in the Philippines at least, and this all the first group to other countries, corporations are controlled by families, by controlling shareholders, and we can try to have high habits, and if you don't get the cooperation of the owners of the controlling shareholders, nothing will happen in terms of promoting minority shareholders. So, thank you again, especially to our board of trustees, for the time uh, our summit uh, committee headed by Mon Fernandez, our staff, Anna Ada Abi, and even Cecil, staff of Chair uh, Evelyn, who have really helped us along the way. Maraming maraming salamat po.